Hello and welcome. My name is Eric Schulte and I teach conservation for school students in Central Kentucky. Today, we'll be learning about wildlife myths. Now a myth is something that's just not true. More like an urban legend or a tall tale. Usually a story passed down from generation to generation and the more times it's told, the more people believe it. So what I'm gonna do for you today is debunk some of these common Kentucky wildlife myths. We're gonna start where we left off yesterday with a snake myth. My associate here, Nikki, is gonna bring over the Eastern milk snake. And I wanna shout out to Rachel and thank you for not revealing the Eastern milk snake myth. As you see, this is the Eastern milk snake common across the state and it has a nickname of being the cow sucker. And what it's said to do is lay out in a big old farm field and wait for a dairy cow to walk over top and then they will leap off the ground, latch onto an udder, and drink all the milk out of the cow. If there are multiple milk snakes, they will all team up on the cow, wrap around the ankles, and tip the cow over. And that's how they say cow tipping was invented. Obviously, this is not true. There's a few reasons why it's not. First, a snake is not just gonna lay there in the path of a big giant cow. If they get stepped on, they'll be crushed. Second, snakes cannot leap. And third, even if the snake could latch onto an udder, snakes are reptiles. Reptiles cannot drink milk. Only mammals can digest milk. The reason they're hanging around the dairy barn so long is because there's a lot of mice around there and they're trying to catch those and eat them. So thank you very much, Nikki. You're welcome. Now for our next critter, this is probably the most misunderstood critter in the whole state. Poor old Mr. Skunk. Now he's a good little dude, I promise you. He's just misunderstood. Now just because you walk across a skunk doesn't mean you're gonna get sprayed. A skunk spray is used as more of like a last resort defense. They will only spray if they feel like their life is in danger. They're gonna save it for when they really need it because if they do use it, it takes a while to build back up. It's no infinite supply. So it might take days, even a week, for that spray to build back up. Before they spray, They'll actually try to warn you first. What they do is they will slap the ground with their front paws, kind of like this, just pat, 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 pat. You can look it up on YouTube after this, it's hilarious. And also what they'll do is they'll clack their teeth because they're making noise. They want you to look down and notice them. And you look down and you say, oh my gosh, it's a skunk. And if you're smart, then you'll leave. And if you're not smart, you'll keep bugging them and you might get yourself sprayed. Now how that spray works is a skunk has scent glands in their rear end back here, and they have muscles around there. And basically what they do is they squeeze their little buns together and it forces out the spray. It's just like squeezing a lemon at somebody. And what they'll also do is they will swing their hind end around at the same time to try to give it a little more momentum, like a little more oomph, like and, and out it goes a lot further now. And they'll try to aim for your eyes. If they get it in your eyes, that stuff stings. It'll leave you temporarily blinded, and you're not gonna go around a skunk for quite some time. So in a manner, they're kinda like a spitting cobra aiming at the eyes. Now I bet they've got really strong muscles back there to be able to do all that. I bet they're just out in the woods just working out all night, just going, buns and thighs, buns and thighs, buns and thighs. And I bet they got really strong buns, you know, like buns of steel. Now, if you've ever watched Looney Tunes, you've probably seen a skunk character on there known as Pepe Le Pew. And what Pepe Le Pew would do is he would hop around the streets of Paris, France, and everywhere he went, he would leave a big odor trail coming off of him. So people got to watching that, and they said, man, well, I bet you skunks, they just reek of odor 24-7. They're probably just oozing all the time. But in real life, that's just not true. If you found a skunk, picked him up, and just smelled him, he smells no different than any other wildlife critter. He smells like your cat. So, now maybe you've noticed driving around in the past month or so, you've seen a lot more skunks smashed in the road as roadkill. Well, the reason for that is February time is skunk breeding season. So what happens is the males are searching high and dry, looking for a big female to have mate with. And then what they'll do is walk right out in the middle of the road and they'll see something coming toward them. And they go, oh look, it's a girl come to daddy, uh, uh, and, poof, and splat they go, and now they're roadkill. 
Turns out it was just a black and white pickup truck. Wasn't a skunk at all. So if you do manage to get some skunk spray on you, because you were chasing after a skunk like some kind of crazy person, there's even a myth about how to get the smell off. Most people will tell you, oh, just take a big bath in tomato juice, and that'll get the smell right off. Well, that's actually a myth. If you take a big bath in tomato juice, all that will do is mask the spray for a short while, and it will wear off. And then you'll just be left smelling like a big rotten tomato. I'm pretty sure I don't want to smell like a big tomato anyway, or I'll have the guy from Campbell's Soup chase me around in my neighborhood. Yeah, come here, boy. So, no thanks. Now, there's actually a household remedy for skunk smell. We like to call it poor man's skunk off. Cheap stuff you can buy at the store. And it's just three ingredients. It is baking soda, hydrogen peroxide, and dish liquid. You mix these up in small amounts in a bucket because it is a chemical reaction. So you, know, you want to take it outside, it might release some fumes. And don't mix it all up together at the same time like you're some kind of mad scientist, like, yeah, and there goes your home. So take it out, small amounts, and you take a sponge in there, mix it all up, and scrub yourself with that, and that will start to break down the chemicals in the skunk spray. So you might have to do it a number of times before it really takes effect, but that's something that'll help you. Now, I think we might have some questions rolling in. Nikki, do you have a question? Yeah. Any so questions? Alex, age nine, is asking, do all black skunks have two white stripes? Oh, well, that's a great question, and what perfect timing. Now, as you see this skunk right here, this is called our Eastern Striped Skunk. Most of the time, they will be black with two white stripes. But you know, they can have color mutations. Sometimes they can be what's called albino. That means they're all white. Other times, they can be melanistic. That means they're all black. Skunks have even been noted to have sort of a brownish tint to them, or even a reddish tint. Sometimes the stripes aren't exactly perfect. They may be crooked, or skewed, or broken, or something like that. And then also, we have another species of skunk in our state. It's called the spotted skunk. It has a polka dot type of pattern, and you can find those down in southeastern Kentucky, although they aren't very common. So thank you for that. It's a good question. Now our next critter. This may be the most fascinating mammal in the whole state. Now if you practice your social distancing and you go on a nice nature hike, keep your eyes peeled. You never know what you might find. You might come across some bones, or you might even find the skull of a possum. Now, possums are neat for how ugly they are. Now, one thing neat about a possum is they are the only marsupial in North America. People say, oh, wow, that's great. Well, what's a marsupial? Well, a marsupial is a mammal that carries their babies in a pouch, like a kangaroo. Now, why they keep their babies in a pouch is because possums, they give birth after only 13 days. 13 days doesn't give you time to look like much of anything. So when they're born, they look like a little jelly bean. It's like a little jelly bean with legs. And they crawl down in their mama's pouch, and they will stay there for two months. Two solid months in that pouch, drinking milk, playing the Xbox, shooting pool, or whatever it is they're doing down there. And then two months later, they emerge, and they look like a little furry possum now. So kind of like how you all are going to look now that the barber shops are closed. So another thing funny about a possum is how many teeth they have. They have the most teeth of any Kentucky land mammal. They have 50 teeth in their mouth. Now, how many teeth does a human have? Well, a human has 32. My Uncle Bob, however, he only has one, and he calls it Old Yeller. But anyway, there are a few myths about possums. One myth is that they like to hang by their tail when they sleep, kind of like a bat. Well, possums don't really hang by their tails for very long. If they did, they would lose strength and fall off. They might hang by their tail for just a short while, but they certainly can't do that long enough to fall asleep. They will use their tail to kind of help them climb, and they'll also carry things like denning material into their den. Now, the most common possum myth is that they play dead. Well, possums, they're not playing anything. But what they actually do is they will faint they will pass out from nervous anxiety. Because let's say that you're a possum. Now what do you do if you're a possum and you're sitting out in the middle of a big old farm field, all right, and you see a big old bobcat running at you from the edge of the woods? Okay, you got no tree out in the middle of the farm field to run up in. You've got no hole to run down to, all right? It's just farm field all around you. If you're a possum, you see a bobcat coming for you, you start to get pretty nervous. 
Okay, and he goes, oh, oh, oh my gosh, it's a, 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 a bobcat. What, what am I going to do? <laughs> and they just pass out, stiff as a board. And that predator gets up to them, starts smelling them, and he goes, well, what's wrong with that thing? I'm not eating that. Junior, get away from there. Don't you touch that. Uh, now go wash your paws. Pete's sake, can't take you anywhere. So predators, for the most part, they like to kill and eat their own food so they know it's good fresh. All right, they don't just typically eat stuff that's just laying around because they don't know what's going on with it. So works pretty well for Mr. Possum. Now here we have a raccoon, nicknamed the trash panda. Well, they do like trash, but they're certainly not a bear. They kind of look like a panda, though, with their face markings there. Now, the biggest misconception about raccoons is that people think Daniel Boone wore a raccoon skin hat. Daniel Boone did not wear a raccoon skin hat. He actually thought raccoon hats were unfashionable. Daniel was a stylish fella, let me tell you. What he actually wore was this right here. He wore a beaver skin hat. Because beaver pelts, back in the pioneer days, were the most valuable type of pelt there was. Trappers went all over the country trying to trap beavers to skin them, get their pelts, sell them, and make a pretty penny. It was called market hunting and trapping. So not only were they very valuable, they were fashionable, and they kept you real warm, they're real good and insulated, and they keep you real dry. So Daniel Boone wore a beaver skin hat. Now where that myth came from, was there was a guy that tried to dress like Daniel Boone in a play. He knew that Daniel Boone wore a beaver skin hat, but he did not have one on hand. So he just grabbed whatever there was at the time, just so happened to be a raccoon hat. He put that on, wore it in the play, and the myth stuck ever since. So. Now this is a neat little piece right here. This is a tiny little bat skeleton a little brown bat, it's the common name. And they are just so small and fragile, I gotta keep them in this little box or they'll fall apart and break. Now, you may have heard your grandma yell at your grandpa at some point saying, you're as blind as a bat. You can't see anything. Well, bats are actually not blind at all. Bats can see just fine. But you know, they're a nocturnal animal, so they fly around at nighttime. They're flying through the dark forest, and they're flying in the dark cave, and they don't run their head into a tree or into the side of the cave wall because they have an extra capability. It's called echolocation. What echolocation is, is they will send out high frequency sound waves like a screech noise. And those sound waves will go out and they'll bounce off stuff like a tree or the cave wall or even a little bug they're trying to eat. Those sound waves will then return to the bat's ears and they can basically hear where things are at. So. They're not blind. Now, if you see bats flying around in your neighborhood, most people get scared. They think bats are going to bite them and they're going to turn into a vampire or something. Well, that's just not true. Okay, vampire bats, they do drink blood, but not from a human. They drink blood from cattle. And they only drink about a teaspoon's worth, and their little belly's full, and they fly off into the night, and they're all happy. So no effects are noted on the cattle. But if you do see bats flying around your neighborhood, it's a good thing. Because what they do is they eat tons and tons of mosquitoes. So if you see more bats around, that means the less mosquito problems you're going to have. So we love bats. We want more of them. Now here's another nice little piece. You might have to zoom in a little bit on this. I'll try to get you to see it. Now this is a black widow spider, that one on top there with the red mark. That is actually the female. What's true about them is the female is a lot bigger than the male black widow, probably about three times the size. Now the black widow myth says that the female supposedly eats the male after mating. And that's why she makes herself a widow and they call her the black widow. But out in nature, this doesn't really occur. They only observe this behavior in laboratories for the most part, where the two are closed together in a box and the male can't escape. The female will just end up eating them eventually. But out in nature, the male will usually make a quick getaway before she devours them. Kind of like I did with my ex-girlfriend. So I got out of there. All right, our next furry critter. This here is the pelt of a cottontail rabbit, the most common wild rabbit in the state. Now typically, they will have a white poofball tail, looks like a cotton ball, 
so they call him the cottontail rabbit. Now this pelt here used to have a cottontail on it, but as you see, I passed this around at a middle school and some sixth grader, yeah, yanked it off. And those sixth graders, I tell you, they're wild. But if you knew who Pepe Le Pew was, then I guarantee you, you know who Bugs Bunny is. If you know Bugs Bunny, then you think rabbits love carrots. Well, in actuality, the orange part of a carrot doesn't really do a whole lot of nutritional value for the rabbit. If he's in your garden snooping around, it's most likely the dark leafy green parts that he's after, much more nutrient dense. Now, if you ever do come across some baby rabbits out in your yard this spring, most people will think that they've been abandoned because they don't see the mother around. Same thing with a baby deer, what's called a fawn. But rest assured, they are not abandoned. The mother, she will not just hang around the babies 24 seven, because if she did, she would draw too much attention to them and the predators would catch on and find out where the babies are. So she will leave them alone most of the day, hidden in the grass or in the bushes somewhere, and she'll go off on her own in search of food and take care of herself, and she'll come back maybe two, maybe three times a day, check on them, feed them, make sure they're all good, and then she'll go back off again. So if you do see them in your yard, just leave them be, they're fine, mother will come back soon. Don't try to take them in your house and raise them to be your very own and all that kind of stuff. Now this here, this is a box turtle shell. Now, most people think that turtles can leave their shell. Well, I'm sorry to say, turtles cannot leave their shell. If they did, they'd be a hermit crab. Now, turtle shell is part of their skeleton. This is made of bone, and it's covered in what's called keratin. That's the same stuff that makes your fingernails. Now, if you look on the inside of this here turtle shell, you can actually see his vertebrae his spinal cord is still fused to the inside of this shell. And there are also the beginnings of the pelvis, the hip bones there, are still there, but as you see, they kind of broke off and the legs broke off over time. But you can see they are fused to their shell. Now, uh, we do have owls here at the Salado Center, but you know, it's daytime and they're sleepy. They're a nocturnal bird. So we're gonna leave them in. I don't wanna disturb them at all. But there is an owl myth I'd like to share with you. Now, most people think that owls will spin their head around in circles in a 360 degree. Well, if you walk out in the woods and you look up in a tree and you see an owl spinning their head around in circles, then you need to call the priest because that owl's possessed. Owls, they can only spin their head 270 degrees. That's like a three quarter rotation. Okay, if they spun their head all the way around in a circle, they'd break their neck and fall out of the tree. Okay, now how they rotate their head 270 is the bones in their neck and the blood vessels are a little different than ours, which allows them to rotate more. Now, if you ever get a chance to be up close to an owl and you get a good look at their eyes, notice that an owl, they cannot move their eyes inside their head. They are locked in place by what are called sclerotic rings. They're basically bony eye sockets, and so if they really want to look around, they have to move their whole entire head. So, now, uh, I think we're going to head over here to the rattlesnake. I'd like to show you a few rattlesnake myths that we have. So why don't we walk on over this way? Just a little hike. Now Rachel showed you the rattlesnake yesterday, and she shared some interesting information about that. And I'd like to highlight a few myths. So rattlesnake has two myths that I'm going to share with you. Now right here, I have a rattlesnake skin. This is a really nice specimen. Now if you notice, this is not a timber rattlesnake, the one that we have in Kentucky. This right here is a western diamondback. They live out in the western part of the country, but as you see, it's just a really good example, and the rattle is perfectly intact. A lot of people think that you can age a rattlesnake by counting how many rows they have. Well, that is just inaccurate. Now what happens when a rattlesnake sheds its skin it will add one row onto the rattle. But the thing is, they shed more than once a year. They'll shed like two or three times a year. And a young snake will shed even more because they're constantly growing. And the rattles on the end, the very end rows, they'll just kind of break and fracture and fall off here and there. So it's pretty random. You can't accurately tell the age of a snake by counting the rows on their rattle. Now, the big urban legend about rattlesnakes in this state is people think that we stocked timber rattlesnakes in Kentucky. Some people will even tell you that we dropped them out of an airplane attached to parachutes and they parachuted all the way to the ground and then they slid her off into the woods. 
Well, that is just completely false. Okay, we have never restocked rattlesnakes in Kentucky, and we have no plans to. Rattlesnakes are doing just fine. They're actually pretty common. Like Rachel said, find them pretty much everywhere except the bluegrass region and the northern Kentucky area. So, do we have any more questions rolling yes, in? Yes, we do. We have quite a bit of questions coming in. So, Tilda, age 10, wants to know, do snakes eat bats? Do snakes eat bats? Yes. You betcha. And I'll tell you, a snake that loves eating bats, it's the common black rat snake. Rat snakes are known to climb up into trees and any, into your roofing and things like that and try to get after any birds, mice, bats even if they can find them. So yeah, a bat makes a tasty meal for a snake, especially a rat snake. Luke, age eight, wants to know if a black widow spider bites you, will it kill you? Oh, good question, Luke. Rest assured, if you get bitten by a black widow, that you're not gonna die, okay? So you'll feel it and it'll leave you with a nice scar and a nice story to tell, but probably not gonna die, all right? Um, if you wanna find black widows, I've heard it from our lead biologists, you just park your lawnmower out in the yard, let it grow up a little bit, go out there in a few weeks and flip it over, look under there, and you might find a bunch of different spiders, maybe a black widow. But if you know they have, the female has that big back end with the red marking, uh, so you wanna avoid spiders. All right. And then Jeff Crouch would like to know, are there beads in the rattlesnake tail? Are there beads? To the make rattlesnake, that sound. What the rattlesnake rattle is, is they are hollow scales. They are modified hollow scales. And when it rattles, they rattle against each other and they make that noise. And basically that's an adaptation over time to warn things to stay away from them and also prevent them from getting stepped on by any kind of big giant animal like a bison or a cow or a horse or something like that. So keeps things aware of their presence. And we'll All do right. two more questions. William, age 10, wants to know, can you have a skunk as a pet? Oh, that's pretty funny. I've heard of uh, some kind of wildlife rehab centers, maybe having a skunk as a pet or maybe a zoo. And what they usually do is they like to take the scent glands out so they can't spray anybody. But uh, for a regular person, a civilian to have a wild animal as a pet, especially something like a skunk, you're gonna need what's called a captive wildlife permit. And you gotta go through some rigorous standards to get that. So just a typical person uh, shouldn't be taking any kind of wildlife into their house, house as a pet. It's best to just leave those out wild where they belong and they're doing just fine. But thank you for the question. All right, last question for right now. Sam, age 12, wants to know what is a hoop snake? A hoop snake. Wow, I can't believe I forgot about that. Thank you for bringing that up. All right, the, the legend of the hoop snake. This originated from the western mud snake, which is a red and black snake, lives out in western Kentucky, and it has a pointy tipped tail. And people thought it was a stinger. It's not a stinger, it's just a pointy tail. And what they use that pointy tail is, they, what they'll do is they will help them eat. They'll push food in their mouth with their pointy tail, because snakes, you know, they don't chew, they swallow whole, so. Well, people started making up rumors and stories that there was this snake with a stinger, and they called it a hoop snake, because they would say it would curl up into like a hula hoop, put the tail in the mouth, and roll down the hill after their prey. And when they got close enough to the prey, they would straighten out in the mid-flight like an arrow and spear the prey with their tail and inject the venom that way. Story went that they had really terrible aim, and they would usually miss the prey and stick into a tree instead, and depending on who you believed, the tree either swelled up with venom or it wilted and died days later. Uh, the only way to escape such an attack was to wait until the very last second and sidestep out of the way and let the hoop snake roll past you. Or if you were really skilled, you could take a tree branch and toss it into the hoop and they'd break them apart and you'd fall over. So, kind of funny. All right, now, for our last few myths that I have for you today, we're gonna head over here to the toad exhibit. Here are the toads right here. You might be able to zoom in on a few of them. We got American toads and Fowler's toads in there, pretty common. Now, the first toad myth is that if you touch a toad, you'll get warts. Well, you cannot get warts from touching a toad. But if you hold on to one for long enough, you'll get something else. You'll get peed on. That's their defense mechanism. It's called bladder evacuation. And that'll make, them, that'll make you let them go real quick. Now, the second toad myth is that if you kiss one, you'll turn them into a handsome prince. Well, I'm sorry, ladies. There's no handsome prince from kissing a toad. If you try it on Valentine's Day, sorry about your luck. But what you will get from kissing a toad, toads have toxic skin. They have what are called parotid glands on their back, make their skin toxic. 
So if you go kissing or licking toads, you're going to get real sick and start throwing up. So if you do touch a toad, I suggest that you wash your hands real good. Just like if you touch anything these days, make sure you wash your hands real good. So those are all the myths that I have for you. Uh, Mickey, do we have any more questions before we finish up? Yes. So Luke, age eight, wants to know, what's the weirdest snake myth you've ever heard? The weirdest snake myth? I would probably say the hoop snake myth. That's, that's probably my favorite myth. Uh, and then, you know, you got the rattlesnakes jumping out of the plane with parachutes. That's kind of odd. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I can think of as far as the snake myths. Um, and the milk snake myth's pretty fun. I shared pretty much every snake myth I know with you. If you know any more, comment below and I'll add them to my story. All right, let's see what else we've got. How do the milk snakes, oh, we've already answered that question. How do the milk snakes get their name? Yeah, the name, because they hang around the dairy barn so much. So that myth probably started somewhere around the agricultural revolution and raising cows and different things like that for milk. And notice so many snakes around that part. So they just started calling them milk snakes, even though they're really just after the mice. Riley, age nine, wants to know if snapping turtles really only let go if they bite you when thunder strikes twice. <laughs> That's a great one. I've heard that a lot. I've heard it my whole childhood. Uh, that is actually not true. Um, sometimes a snapping turtle will snap at you and release immediately. Sometimes they'll hold on. It's just kind of hit and miss. Uh, so it's not the sound of thunder. But I guess if you want to yell real loud, they might think that's thunder and maybe let go. So I might try that. All right. And then Adam, age nine, wants to know what is the funniest wildlife myth you've ever heard? Gosh, the funniest wildlife myth. Well, I might have shared it with you today. Uh, if I can think of anything else, uh, I guess I'll have to comment, but the funniest wildlife myth, gosh, I like the owls spinning their head around in circles and people thinking they're possessed. I think that's kind of funny, even though that's just a joke. So they're not really possessed. They can't turn their heads all the way around. So don't have nightmares or anything. But anyway, is that all the questions that we have? Yep, that is it. All right. That's good. Well, thank you all so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I hope you like that. And have a good, safe weekend, and hopefully we'll see you again on Monday.